Well, out of all of us here, I was the lucky one to receive the following email this past week. I, I want to read it to you, okay? The subject line says this, urgent attention needed. Dear Phil, I am Mr. Eric Scotch, head officer in charge for the United Nations Inspection Agency in Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, Atlanta, Georgia. I discovered an abandoned shipment through a diplomat from the UK, which was transferred from JF Kennedy Airport to our facility, and when scanned, it revealed an undeclosed sum of money in two metal trunks. <laughs> By my assessment, I'm like, yes, right? By my assessment, each of these boxes contains around $4 million or more. They are still left at the airport storage facility, and the details of the consignment, including your name and contact info, are on the official document from the UN office. As it stands now, you just have to confirm that information, and we can send you these boxes. <laughs> if you decide not to, we'll have to return them to the UK. You can either come in person, or you can engage the services of a secure shipping company. But here's the deal. I need the entire guarantee that I can get from you before I get involved with this project. Best regards. Well, just so you guys know, I'm heading to Atlanta tomorrow, so it's all good, all right? We're going to be okay. But, like, if only it were that easy, right? Like, if only. But it's never that easy. Nothing is that easy. With the new year ahead of us, there's a lot of us who want to make some changes in our lives. We want new patterns, maybe new behaviors. And friends, I just want to tell you, it's not going to be easy. It takes intentionality. It takes effort. It takes discipline. And a lot of what can make or break new in our lives comes down to our habits, what habits have you formed in your life? Or what are some habits that you should be forming? Because we all have habits. And some are good, like showering and shaving and brushing your teeth. I mean, just lean into the person next to you. They'll be glad you brushed your teeth this morning. You know what I'm saying? And some aren't as good, like smoking or eating fast food or biting your nails. It's been said, habits will determine our future and they will determine our quality of life. And so we all know that good habits produce outcomes that we want. Bad habits, on the other side, become debilitating, life-altering, and for a lot of us, they get us stuck. Many times, they're the things we don't want to be doing, but we do them anyway. Do you ever find, do you ever find yourself saying, I can't believe I did this again? Like, you wish you could stop, but in a way, it's kind of weird, because you can't, right? And it's like, Paul, he's a writer in the New Testament, he actually said it this way. I do not understand my actions, my own actions, for I am as far from habitually doing what I want to do that I find myself doing the very thing I hate. Bad habits are often practices we hate. And the irony is we initially chose those habits. They were formed through willful behavior. And that's, for me, what's so mysterious about a bad habit. They can escalate to the point where they actually break our will. Something destructive becomes so compelling that it's greater than our will. Peter, he was a close friend of Jesus. He was a disciple of Christ. And he actually wrote uh, a few books in the New Testament. And he said that once a habit controls you, that habit is your master. He said it this way, a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. So let me ask you, are you allowing something to control your life that really doesn't have the power to control you except the power that you give it? Paul said it this way, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't be burdened by the thing that is mastering you. Because when we're mastered by something, we live in an endless cycle of guilt and shame. And the truth is we all carry guilt to some degree in our lives. It's for stuff we've done, stuff we are doing, stuff we think about, and really it's stuff that's unchangeable. And it can take us to the point where guilt totally wrecks us. It can take us actually to really dark places. So for example, we can't even look people in the eye when we're talking with them because we fear they may see what we are hiding. 
or, or we can't come to God because we feel he knows what's going on in our lives and maybe he somehow ticked off with us. And I don't know what it might be for you, but maybe you drank too much one night and you did something you can't undo or you said something that you can't unsay. Or maybe it was years ago you felt cornered into a certain situation and you thought you made the right decision, but you've regretted it ever since. Or maybe you poured yourself into your job. You said, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be a good provider. And then years went by and suddenly you realize you're totally disconnected from your kids. And you think, what did I do? Why did I do that? Or maybe you just found yourself in a really odd spot in your marriage. And instead of stepping into your marriage, you stepped out of your marriage. You did something. You betrayed your spouse and you just can't get over the guilt. Or maybe for you, it's just looking at things online, and you know, you shouldn't be looking at these things, you you love God, you might be married, you love your spouse, but you keep going back and back and back, and the shame and the guilt of what you are doing is just overwhelming. What do you do when what you did haunts you? When the guilt won't go away, when you want a new, but you feel you're stuck in this habit that you wish you could stop? Well, first off, let me say this. Not all guilt is created equal. Some of us, we're living under what I would call false guilt. You're feeling guilty for something you actually shouldn't feel guilty about. And, uh, you know, let me give you a couple examples here. Maybe your parents divorced when you were younger and you feel that you had a part to play in that. That's not your fault. That's false guilt. Or maybe someone abused their power over you physically, emotionally, and it's sad, but, you know, we often feel that we had something to do with that. And hear me out. That's not your fault. Don't buy into the devil's game of shaming you with false guilt because false guilt is dangerous and it's not from God. But remember I said not... All guilt is created equal because there's another type of guilt. And believe it or not, this type of guilt can actually draw you closer to God. Listen to something else Paul wrote. He said it this way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow leads or brings death. Godly sorrow is a sorrow that says, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I didn't do that. And godly sorrow is, in fact, something that a new pastor discovered as he had a job pastoring his first church. And it was a small church. And he had this idea. He said, you know, I'm going to go out and visit all the people in my church and just get to know them a little bit better and spend some time chatting with them. And so he was doing that in his week. And things were going pretty good for him until he arrived at this one house. And uh, he knew someone was home, but no one was coming to the door. And, and anyone ever do that? You know what I'm talking about, right? And so he, he kept knocking, he kept knocking, and they're not answering, they're not answering. So finally, he um, rang the doorbell, he rang it again, and they still weren't answering, to which he, being a fast thinker, pulled out his business card, and on the back of the card, he wrote Revelation 3.20, and he just stuck his card in the back of the door. Now, the next Sunday, after the service, to his shock, an usher handed him that same card, said, someone gave this um, for you, and he looked at it, and he's like, wow, it's that card. And now, added to his inscription was the inscription, Genesis 3.10. He's like, man, i got to figure out what that says. And so he quickly looked, out, looked it up in his Bible, and he starts to laugh, because Revelation 3.20 says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and Genesis 3.10 reads, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked. <laughs> So, needless to say, that pastor only makes phone calls now. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) But godly sorrow says it wasn't the right thing. I dishonored God. I hurt somebody. I would give anything to not do that again. And you know what that leads to? Two things. Salvation and no regrets. Man, think about that. No regrets. Sign me up, right? You see, godly sorrow, it takes us off a wrong path. It can motivate us to say, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to be like this anymore. I I want to change. I want to be different. I want a new. I want to break this habit. And every single one of us have asked, why did I do that? In a moment of anger, we did something we wish we didn't do, or we said something we wish we didn't say, and and, and it's like we promise ourselves it's not going to happen again, and then it does. 
And then we're like, man, why was I so stupid? How could God love someone like me who never gets it right? Someone who always falls short. Someone who hurts those I love. And we're stuck in what's called a cycle, a habit. Wondering, does God even have any hope for me at all? And hear me out. The moment you land there is the moment the devil has you exactly where he wants you to be. Because you have now moved from guilt to shame. You see, guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am a bad person. And what your adversary tries to do is to use your action to connect it with your identity to create a sense of shame. And so we tend to believe that we are worthless or that we are useless, that God will never use us again. And so we say things like, I'm never going to be truly happy again. I will never measure up. I won't have a real ministry again. I can't have a great marriage. I'm not going to leave this positive legacy. I will always be marked by the things I did. And if you're there, I want to speak life to you today. I want to speak new to you today. Hear me out. The devil wants to use your shame to drive you away from God, but God wants to use your guilt to drive you to his grace. And what I want to do is I want to take you to a passage in the Old Testament that was actually written by an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And truthfully, this passage could be kind of like um, an indie emo song that's just talking about how super depressed he is and how full of guilt someone is. And it's found in the book of the Old Testament called Lamentations, which just means lament. And if you were to actually um, look at the Hebrew word for this, it would be the question, how? And so I want to take you to chapter 3 and highlight just some of the things that Jeremiah is writing here. And by the way, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. So you can get an idea of where he's heading here. Listen to this. I'm the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has broken my bones. He has surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Okay, friends, this guy is depressed, okay? This guy is loathing in his guilt. He's teetering between sorrow and depression, between shame and guilt. And the reality is, I think every single one of us can relate on some level to those emotions. Things like affliction, bitterness, hardship, something weighing us down. That's all about those habits that control us. God not hearing our prayers, our soul feeling downcast. We can all relate to that. And imagine if I were just to say, okay, that's it for church today. Peace out, guys. You'd be like, what? I feel totally depressed. I'm walking out like Jeremiah the weeping prophet, right? But what, but what I want to give you is some amazing news for your next, some amazing news for this year 2020 ahead of us. Because he doesn't just leave it there. He says, my soul is downcast within me. But then he says another word. He says the word, yet. My soul is downcast within me, yet. And that word, yet, is crucial. Like, I may feel down. I may feel guilty. I may feel ashamed. I may feel all these things, yet. And I love it because yet says there is always hope. Yet says it's not over. Yet screams there is more. Yet says there is another way. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're processing or walking through, there is a yet for your life. And here's the yet. He says, I call this to mind, and because of it, I have hope. Now, the word call means to cry out in order to attract attention. To call is an action word then. It's not something that just happens automatic in our lives. And so in our habits and in our guilt, we we need to take the initiative to remind ourselves who God is, to call to mind this critical thing. And what is it that we need to call to mind? What is it that's going to bring us hope? Listen to what Jeremiah writes. He says this, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. 
great is your faithfulness. I love those verses. You see, the devil wants to use your shame to drive you away from God, but God wants to use your guilt to drive you to his grace. You know, his love, his compassions, they never fail. They are new every morning. So every 24 hours, we're granted a reset in life. We are granted the ability to start again. We are granted a clean slate with the only words that are on it that say, I love you, signed God. And every day we're granted this gift of new, and it comes down to a choice. Do we believe God or do we not? Do we get sucked into shame or do we allow our guilt to drive us to repentance, which leads to no regrets? Paul said it this way, nothing from all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In other words, he's saying we're stuck with God's love. Nothing, absolutely nothing can stop God from loving us. Not bad habits, not guilt, not actions we wish we never did. Nothing. He just keeps on loving us. And God is saying at the start of this year, let go of the things that have held you back. Let go of the things that have held you down. Why? Because his compassion, his mercies, they are new every day. That's how faithful he is. Hope lies in a new day. Hope lies in the fact that he is a faithful God who won't let you down. He's a faithful God who forgives. And he's a faithful God who's so great that he can provide a next and a new despite you feeling like you're done. Hear me out, friends. God's power is greater than your past. And every day is a reset for you. And I can't help but think that this guy that's talked about in Scripture, a guy by the name of Peter, he's just this perfect example of this. He spent three years with Jesus. He was part of Jesus' inner circle. And the night before Jesus was betrayed, he was hanging out with his disciples, and Peter was one of them. They're having dinner, and, and Peter looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, I will never betray you. In fact, I will even die for you. Like, Peter was all in here, okay? He was fully convinced. He was ready for what would come his way. But literally, hours later, Jesus was arrested. And Peter, he was actually the only disciple that followed after Jesus. Everyone else just kind of scattered. And he went into the courtyard of the place where Jesus was being questioned. And it was in that courtyard where things just went a little off for Peter. He was asked the question, are you a friend of Jesus? Did you hang out with Jesus? And he just rejected it completely. And I'm kind of like, so much for dying with Jesus, you're just denying Jesus now, right? And then he shuffles away to another corner of the courtyard. He's hanging out at a fire to keep warm. And someone throws the same question his way. Hey, aren't you part of Jesus' circle? To which Peter says, I, I, I don't really know what you're talking about. And then a little while later, he gets called out one more time. And this time, Peter more emphatically says, I don't know the guy. And it's at this moment, a rooster crows. And Peter is reminded of what Jesus told him the night before. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And immediately, Peter feels remorse. We read that he actually left the courtyard and wept bitterly. He had this godly sorrow for what he did. He wished he would have never done and said what he did, but it was too late. And you can almost imagine him, oh man, I'm so sorry, God. I want another chance. I want a next. Please forgive me. Paul said godly sorrow brings repentance, meaning I don't want to do what I just did. I want a new way. New way. I want to treat someone differently, not the way I treated them. I don't want to click on that site again. I want to follow God's ways. I want to find freedom. I, I, don't, I, don't just, I don't want to be a jerk. I want to be a blessing. I don't want to be a voice of anger. I want to be a voice of hope. Repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry, and I'm done making excuses. I mean, this is what Jesus gave his life for for our forgiveness. The perfect one became sin for us on a cross. He died in our place, and three days later, God raised him from the dead so that you can be forgiven, so that every single one of us can have a reset every single day of our lives. And so Peter denies Jesus three times. And after his resurrection, Jesus encounters Peter, and John, a New Testament writer, uh, 
tells us about this encounter. It's found in uh, chapter 21 of John's book. And you can imagine Peter, okay? So Jesus is approaching and he shows up and he kind of be like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it. But in that moment, Jesus just looks at Peter and he asks him this question, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, I love you, I did love you, I just did something I totally regret. Now, notice Jesus didn't say, oh, I told you, Peter, I told you you would do it, I was right, I knew you couldn't handle the pressure, and now I just want you to wallow in your guilt, He didn't go there. In fact, he asked them again. He says, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, I totally love you. And then Jesus asked him one more time, do you love me? And you get what he's doing here, right? Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And that's just as many times as Peter denied Jesus. He's taking each of those moments and he's saying, it's done. I've got a new for you. My grace and my mercy covers every single one of those denials. I'm alive today to tell you my compassions never fail. My mercies are new every morning. Great is my faithfulness to you. And then Jesus says this to Peter. It's, it's kind of the yet moment for Peter, okay? He looks at him and says, well, if you love me, then feed my sheep. In other words, if you love me, then do my will. Finish your assignment. Go to your next. Live out the calling I have for you. Step into the new. Break that habit. Break that guilt and move on. And what Peter didn't do was say, oh, nah, Jesus, I can't. Yeah, your love and your grace, it's good for everyone else, but it's not for me. I don't deserve it, Jesus. He didn't do that, but sometimes that's what we do. We say, oh, I can't really be forgiven. I've done this way too many times. I deserve to live in shame the rest of my life. Not Peter. He repented. He received the forgiveness from Jesus, and he moved on. And I don't know what you might be holding on to. Something you didn't do years ago that you should have done. Something that still weighs heavy on you. Maybe it was even from last night. Something you said. Something you did. It was a moment of stupidity. And if you've confessed it, if you've given it to Jesus, it's forgiven. And let me say this, it's time for you to let go. Let it go, my friends. I could start singing that annoying Disney song. I promise you I won't. But let it go, okay? John says it this way. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Purify us from how much? All. That's everything you've ever done. Not just some of it. And so let go of it, my friend. Tomorrow is a new day. Tomorrow God has a next. Tomorrow is a reset that says, I am a God of compassion. I'm a God of love. I'm a God of mercy. These things are new every morning. Great is my faithfulness to you. And whatever you have done, hear me out. God doesn't hold it against you. If you've taken it to him, he's forgotten it. You're free. You're free to move on. Don't let the pain of the past rob you from God's calling for your future. You cannot change your past, friends, but the good news is with God, you can change your future. So step into that reset that God has for you. Let 2020 be a year of growth, not stalling, of refreshing, not rehashing, of moving forward, not staying stuck. And remember this, your spiritual enemy, he's sly, and every now and then he's going to bring up your past. He's going to say, you did this, you thought this, you said this, you weren't there for them, you let them down. You can never undo that. Well, here's just a little thought, okay? Anytime the devil brings up your past, just remind yourself he's bringing up your past because he's intimidated by your future. See, friends, listen to me. God's hand is still on you. His grace is still with you. His power still works through you. Your enemy is trying to talk you out of God's potential for your life. Now, check this out. And I think this is super cool, okay? Who did Jesus choose to be the guest speaker at this event that we have called Pentecost, where God poured out, for the first time, his Holy Spirit? Are you ready for this? Jesus chose Peter. He chose the guy who denied him three times. And what was Peter's message that day? Peter said, repent of your sins, turn from them, call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved, and you will be forgiven. 
You see, Jesus didn't choose the one who was perfect to say this. He chose the one who was forgiven. He didn't choose the one who was always faithful. He chose the one who had experienced grace. Friends, you are not what you did or what you keep on doing. Never connect your action to your identity. You did something bad, but it's not who you are. You are a child of God. And it may have been a bad page in your book, or it may have been a bad few chapters in your book. You can't change the beginning, but you can change the ending. Your story isn't over yet. God is still writing your story, and I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. There is new waiting for you, and how can I be so sure of this? I'll tell you how. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Walk in that. Own that. Let that sit in your heart and mind today. I'm going to ask you to stand if you can, please. I want to close in prayer. God, I thank you that we can come before you. And it doesn't matter what kind of past any of us have doesn't matter the things we've done or the things we are doing. As, as we come to you, you are a God of forgiveness. You are a God of compassion, of mercy. And they are new every day. And I thank you for that faithfulness inside every single one of our lives. I pray for that person who might be walking in shame. I pray for that person who just needs to let some things go, release them and say, from this day forward, I will walk into the new. I will walk into the faithfulness of God. I will trust and believe what he says about my life and move forward. And I pray that they are able to just bury that, to let it go and to move on. God, may, may your mercies and your compassions be made real inside of their lives. And may they understand that every day is a new day in you. And as we face this year, we move forward and we're not bound by things from the past, God, that have held us down. And maybe you're here and you're saying, you know, my big new for me in 2020 is just even starting a relationship with Jesus. I recognize that I need him in my life. I recognize that I have all these bad habits or things that I want to leave behind and move forward into a new with him. And if that's you, I'm just going to pray a prayer and you can pray along with me and make this personal for yourself. Jesus says, I'm here today. I just, I see my need for you. And I ask you to come into my life. I thank you for dying on the cross, for the forgiveness of my sins, for the ability for me to start again. I thank you that you rose again to offer me life now and forevermore. And so I just commit myself to you and I want to pattern myself to your ways of living and doing life and help me to leave my past that I regret and help me to move forward into something that I want to embrace. And so I just commit that to you. And Lord, I pray over every individual, for every couple, and for every family that's represented here today. I pray that you go before them, guide them, and lead them in this week. And no matter what they face, may they understand that your compassions never fail and that your faithfulness is there every single day. And may they walk in that by your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. You know, if you're here today and you prayed that prayer of just committing your life to Christ for the first time or maybe a recommitment prayer, can I ask you to text the word LIFE to 555-888? We would just love to get a digital booklet inside of your hands. It talks a little bit more about what it means to know Jesus and follow him. And it also gives you an opportunity, if you choose, to connect with one of our pastors. If any of you want prayer about anything in your life, we're going to have our prayer team available down at the front right after the service. And remember, as you exit this place, we have our connecting point out there, our small group sign up. I encourage you, if you haven't connected in our church, this is a great way to make some friends, to just grow in your faith and grow in relationship. So thank you for being here this morning. Know that you're loved. Know that you are prayed for. And remember that his compassions never fail. And they are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Go with God. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here.